<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of College and Career Pathways, where every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 p.m., we provide you with information on various colleges and universities and financial aid resources, um, technical programs, uh, skilled trade professions, employment opportunities, and um, career readiness skills, all designed to help you make the best career decisions possible. I'm Tony Kirchin, your host, and today we are with uh, MI Student Aid, the Depart Michigan Department of Treasury, and we are going to be doing Financial Aid 101. Uh, thank you so much, Felicia, for being here. We so appreciate your time. Of course, happy to be here. So um, again, as Ms. Tony announced, my name is Felicia Pelto. I am one of the outreach analysts for the State of Michigan Treasury. Also, um, you know, our office has many names, this Office of Student Scholarships, Grants, and Outreach. Um, but for short, we call ourselves My Student Aid, as you can see here. And so I'll go ahead and get started since I know we have just a, an hour of time and I would just wanna make sure that we're able to, you know, answer any questions that may exist. So let me go ahead and get started. All right, so um, as mentioned, I'm gonna be just doing financial aid 101. Um, of course, for my student aid, hoping to help make college accessible, affordable and attainable. And just a quick overview of what I'll be going over. I'm gonna also um, just shut my video off just to eliminate um, the grabbing of bandwidth, you know, usually when you're projecting video along with sharing, sometimes that'll cause me to glitch a little bit. Um, so I'll go ahead and, um, you know, unshare myself. <laughs> um, but to continue going over the overview here. Oh, sorry, moving a little fast there, double click the button. Um, but the institutions, I'm going to talk about the institutions to consider the types of financial aid that exist. Um, how it all stems from the FAFSA. And once you complete that FAFSA, the federal programs as well as state programs that you may be eligible for. A little bit of details about my office, which is that Michigan Student Scholarships, Grants and Outreach. Scholarships that are available that we found in our area or in general for you guys. And uh, a Q&A if you guys have any. All right, rolling right into it. What institutions are you considering? Now, hopefully you're considering all three types, which are community colleges, public colleges and universities, as well as private colleges and universities. However, I do want to bring our attention to um, the bullet points that we have here. The first one here being the average COA. That COA stands for cost of attendance. And this is the average that we found here in Michigan, right? Um, as well as when you notice from the community college to the public college and university, that average cost of, of attendance kind of doubles. And typically, you know, from what I've seen in my experience, that has more to do with housing um, because typically community colleges don't really have housing. However, there is the one unique one that is actually my alma mater, Jackson College. They ended up building dorms just as I was exiting um, and transferring to my four year public university to get my bachelor's. And then um, you'll notice from public to private, um, which is very similar to if you decide to go to out-of-state college as well, um, where you'll notice it kind of doubles again. And again, just from my experience, I've noticed that, you know, when it comes to private or independent colleges or universities, everyone's charged the same amount. Doesn't matter if you're in-state, out-of-state, you know, there's nothing special about you per se, um, but in a good way. Whereas at a public um, college or university, you know, this would be more so like the in-state or, um, yeah, the in-state or resident rate. And this would be more so like the out-of-state um, non-resident rate. So the main differences between these three, too, is that when it comes to a community college, you're looking for anything that's a two-year degree and below. Um, so your licenses that can be, you know, a year or less. Uh, certificate programs, as well as associate degrees, but again, two years or less. 
Now, some public colleges, as well as private um, colleges and universities, may offer associate certificate degrees sometimes, but their main predominant degrees that they're offering are bachelor's, which are four-year degrees, as well as graduate programs. So that's when you're trying to master a subject or maybe get your PhD or doctorate. But I often like to, you know, joke, but in all seriousness, you know, we when we go to the doctor, we're not asking, you know, hey, did you get your credits from a community college and then transfer? Or, you know, what, what career pathway, what path, college pathway did you take in order to become a doctor? Because, you know, if, if, if you went to your community college, I don't want you working on me, right? We don't usually say that. Um, so I always like to remind students that even though you may see, you know, this number um, as being, you know, less expensive, I wouldn't necessarily relate that to the value that it's necessarily giving you. Um, because, you know, a doctor is a doctor is a doctor, as well as a nurse is a nurse is a nurse. As long as they got the credentials at the end of the day to be successful and they were hired by that institution or a place of business, they're qualified. And so I always say to do it the most fiscally responsible way. And then to discuss the different sources of financial aid, there is the federal government, the state government, which is where I hail from, the institutions such as the colleges and universities themselves, as well as private and third party. So associations, foundations, clubs, employers, churches, unions. So I often say anywhere you live, work, eat, or play, anywhere you see money exchange, you have that opportunity to potentially get college scholarships. Um, for example, um, you know, a lot of, we probably heard a lot about the Detroit Promise, and that is a foundation also known, um, yeah, that's a foundation. And so they offer the, that third party source of funding, which is the De Detroit Promise. Um, so like I said, anywhere you live, work, eat, or play, wherever money is exchanged, you may be eligible for a potential scholarship. And to elaborate a little further on the different types, I usually break it down in three ways. There's free money, earned money, and then borrowed money. Free money, we think about those scholarships as I was kind of talking about before with those different third party opportunities. And we often think about it being merit-based. So like grades or test scores, which is one of the ways that you could be eligible for a scholarship. But I specifically remember, and this was even in a presentation I was a part of um, just last night where my co-presenter uh, from Sally May had mentioned that her daughter just having mentioned that she was left-handed in a, um, in I think a, a scholarship essay or just kind of her intro essay to college, she ended up getting a left-handed scholarship. And that's actually the, about the third time I've heard someone say that they know someone that's gotten a scholarship just for being left-handed. So I always say, think about unique identifiers for yourself, you know, being left-handed, um, you know, just as I mentioned, unique identifiers that you may not think um, are eligible for a scholarship, but sometimes are. Um, so sometimes being really open about yourself can allow someone to identify something more that you're eligible for. Um, we're all very common in hearing about sports scholarships. And so, you know, again, there are lots of ways to be eligible. Then there's grants. Grants are considered need-based, and those are usually determined by completing the FAFSA, which I'll talk a little bit about here in a moment. And then there's earned money. I'll elaborate on this a little later, but it's a form of work study. So um, essentially it's a grant that allows you to earn the money as you're going to school um, through having a job. And then there's borrowed money, which I know that gets a lot of negativity, but it is a reality of the world. You know, people borrow for purchasing a car, a home. Um, these days, even our cell phones are on technically little loans that we may not always be privy to. So even though it may not be something you wanna think about in your financial aid um, calculation, it is a reality and it is considered a type of financial aid. So I just wanna make sure that by the end of this presentation, you're aware for one, that loans do need to be repaid with interest and that when accepting or declining a student loan, that it's important to consider whether or not you'll earn enough after college to pay it off and have a manageable debt. And I have some tools towards the end to help you understand that. So moving on to the FAFSA, I always wanna reiterate that FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Um, and so if you ever get to a space where it's trying to make you pay for it, I would definitely, you know, that is the wrong place to be. 
on the website. And this is a little bit of what the FAFSA looks like and how the website essentially looks. And I often too like to just kind of bring up some points of seeing, you know, that this is an official website of the United States government, federal student aid, um, those being some like key markers, you'll notice FAFSA.gov. So if it tries to reroute you to any kind of other website that doesn't have .gov on the end of it, um, then you're very likely in the wrong place. And then I do have just a short video. So give me a moment just to kind of redo my share here. Felicia, your audio is really low. Okay. Make sure My you share. Apology. Yep, let me go ahead and reshare, but make sure that I share my sound and optimize yeah. it for that video clip. Thank you, sorry about no, that. No problem. We'll go ahead and restart it. If you're interested there in you financial go. Good deal. college or career school, you're going to need to fill out the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA. It takes most people about 30 minutes to complete online. And the best part, it's 100% free. And it provides you with access to grants, loans, and work study funds from the federal government. And many colleges and states use FAFSA information to provide their own college or state financial aid. Before you fill out the FAFSA, it's a good idea to create your FSA ID, a username and password that lets you electronically sign your FAFSA and gives you access to various websites related to federal student aid. And here's an important tip. If your parent is providing information on your FAFSA, he or she will need his or her own FSA ID. Visit studentaid.gov forward slash FSA ID for more information. Your FAFSA can be completed online at FAFSA.gov and help is provided throughout the online application process. You will need to fill out the FAFSA each year you are in school because your financial situation may change. Plus, you may be able to automatically transfer your tax data from the IRS, making the application even quicker to fill out. Each state and college or career school sets its own deadline for the FAFSA, so it's best to get it done early. Since some of the funds are available on a first-come, first-served basis, you don't want to miss out. Now that you know about the FAFSA, you might be asking, well, how much money will I get? Your college or career school will do the math, and there's a simple formula that they use. First, the college takes your cost of attendance, which is the total amount it will cost you to go to that school. Your cost of attendance will vary from school to school. Then, the college subtracts your expected family contribution, or EFC. Your EFC is based on information provided in your FAFSA and will not change based on the school you attend. However, the EFC is not necessarily the amount of money you will have to pay. Basically, your cost of attendance minus your EFC equals your financial need. Your college uses your financial need and other information to determine how much financial aid you can receive. See? Pretty simple. If you have questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. And going forward, I will likely stop the video just a little early because it's going to share that same information of, you know, if you have more questions, you know, go to studentaid.gov. So I'll likely, you know, stop it just to get that half a minute back <laughs> in terms of presentation time. But just to reiterate some quick facts. It can be completed online and that is preferred. I believe actually now it's the only way. Um, they actually no longer allow for paper FAFSAs, which is a good thing. It took anywhere between eight to 16 weeks sometimes for them to process that. And when you do it online, three to five business days. So significantly <laughs> a big difference. It can also be completed through the studentaid.gov app, which is um, something you can be downloaded on Google Play or your Apple iPhone. As I mentioned earlier, avoid being scammed because the first, the F in the first uh, part of the acronym FAFSA stands for free. So if anyone's trying to get you to pay, run in the other direction. 
it does have to be completed every year. So for every year you plan on going to college, you want to complete it. And so if you're a senior this year and you're intending on starting this fall, which is fall of 22, you're going to be in the middle of your fall semester when that um, date opens up October 1 for you to be able to complete the FAFSA for your sophomore year. So if I were you, I would go ahead and put that reminder in my phone to just remind you annually October 1st, because as it mentioned in the video as well, you want to make sure that you do it as soon as possible because there are different awards institutional, statewide, um, that are on a first come first serve basis. And when it comes to certain scholarship opportunities with the state of Michigan, March 1st is our priority deadline. Now, uniquely for this year, we extended that deadline to May 1st. So if you haven't completed your FAFSA yet, uh, you still have time to be eligible for some of your state of Michigan scholarships, but keep in mind that the clock is ticking and that deadline is going away here soon. Now we talked about um, once you've completed the FAFSA, you'll receive this notification and you'll receive something known as your expected or estimated family contribution. Um, we abbreviate that as the EFC. This is what colleges use to determine the different types of financial aid that you're eligible for. But you know the words can seem misleading in that, right? It's the estimated or expected family contribution. So it feels as though you need to pay something, but I wanna just, give you the comfort of knowing that it is not the amount that you and your family, family need to pay up front. However, the variables that impact your EFC are student and parent income, because they're looking at the household income, family household size, so how much of that income is covering how many heads and mouths to feed, number going to college, because even though you're not a part of that household while in college, you still are in the aspect that, you know, if you were earning money and contributing to that household, or your parents are paying towards things, you know, you're still a part of that household, even indirectly. And then the amount paid in taxes. And sometimes I get these questions about, you know, hey, my student's gonna be not living with me anymore. They're gonna be off on their own, as well as um, students might be feeling as though like, hey, I'm gonna be taking care of myself, paying my own bills. Like, do I need to have my parents' information? And this is essentially a list of, you know, if these situations are applicable to you, then they would essentially apply you as being an independent student and not requiring parental information. Um, but I also do have a short video that will supplement this information. So give me one second just to do another quick flip of the screen here. When you fill out the FAFSA, you'll be asked several questions that will determine whether you are an independent or dependent student. This is an important distinction, because if you're a dependent student, then you'll need to include your parents' financial information on your FAFSA. This means that your parents' financial information will be considered along with your information to determine your eligibility for federal student aid. So how do you figure out if you're an independent or dependent student? Generally, if you are a graduate student, on active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces, a veteran, are married, have children whom you support, or are 24 or older, then you are considered an independent student. If you don't meet any of these criteria, then you're likely considered a dependent student and will have to provide your parents' financial information when completing the FAFSA. If you have a different living situation, including divorced parents or living under the care of a grandparent or other relative, the online FAFSA will provide guidance to help you answer the parent questions. In other special circumstances, your status may not be as easy to determine and you'll need guidance from the financial aid office at the college or career school you plan to attend. Some common questions that people often ask are, what if the FAFSA tells me I'm a dependent student? but my parents don't claim me on their taxes or I've moved out of their house and am financially independent. While these situations do arise, they aren't part of the criteria for independent status on the FAFSA. So you would still be required to report your parents' financial information on the FAFSA. What if I'm considered a dependent student but have no contact with my parents or access to their information? There are other options available to you in these situations. So it is possible for a dependent student 
to submit the FAFSA without parental information. If you have indicated on your FAFSA that you cannot contact your parents or access their financial information, you'll need to speak to staff at the financial aid office at the college or career school you plan to attend. The financial aid staff will tell you what to do next. So what if my parents aren't going to help me pay for college and refuse to provide information for my FAFSA? If this is the case, the only federal aid you may be able to receive will be an unsubsidized loan, which is a federal student loan that begins accruing interest as soon as you receive your funds. To find out whether you can get the loan, fill out your FAFSA and then speak to the financial aid staff at the college or career school that you wish to attend. If you have any other questions regarding financial aid, your college or career school will be able to answer them for you and, if appropriate, make a decision about your dependency status. Their decision is final and cannot be appealed to the U.S. Department of Education. No matter your dependency status, make sure to complete the FAFSA to find out what federal money you can get for college or career school. If you have questions or need more information, And the swapping back. All right, so um, after that, you might be thinking, all right, so if I know I'm a dependent student and none of those situations apply to me, which parent's information should I use? So then if your parents are married to each other, you would need both parents' info, even though you only need one parent to essentially sign and complete the FAFSA with you. Um, it does require that you have at least one parent signature on the FAFSA, and then they can essentially provide both parental information. And then if your parents are legally separated or divorced, you're going to use whoever has custody over you, that parent's info. But let's say your um, the parent that has custody over you has now remarried to a step parent. If that remarried parent has that custody over you, you would use both your parent and that step parent's information for income. And then if your parents were never married and not living together, again, this would be similar to the legally separated or divorced where you would just use that person that has custody over you. And if your parents were never married, but living together, so to the world they appear married, um, you would use both parents' information. And now if for some reason, even though uh, there is that situation where the FAFSA tells you that you're independent or that you are dependent, my apologies. If the FAFSA tells you that you're dependent and similar to what the video kind of talked about, that you're in a unique situation where it's telling you you're dependent, but yet you cannot pro provide parental information because maybe you have a special circumstance going on. Uh, what schools call that is professional judgment. And so it's a special circumstance um, that may allow a student's financial aid award package to be reevaluated. You do have to inquire with the college's financial aid office to see if you're eligible for a professional judgment. And as the video had mentioned, that is up to them. It is not something you can appeal to the Department of Education. So you wanna make sure that you're being completely honest and open about the situation that's going on because they will require documentation to support whatever situation or special circumstance that you're mentioning. But some very common ones that are, um, that are often brought to the financial aid offices are changes in income. So for example, with COVID, you know, we're all aware incomes had changed. So that might be relevant change in household size as a result of an unfortunate divorce um, or a marriage if that increased the household size. Um, dependency override due to an unfortunate circumstance of family breakdown um, as a result of abuse, neglect, or homelessness. So those are some other unfortunately common um, override uh, or professional judgment exceptions. So assuming that you got all through the FAFSA and all the rigmarole of that, and you get an award letter at the end, these are the federal aid programs that you may be eligible for. So when it comes to these federal aid programs, you may be, you're gonna be considered for the federal Pell Grant, which is the largest federal grant that exists. The Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, also known as FSEOG. You'll notice that uh, the government likes their acronyms. There's federal work study, which is that one I 
mentioned, and I do have its own slide where I can talk a little bit more about it. Uh, teacher education assistance for higher education grant. They call that the TEACH grant for those that are specifically interested in going into teaching. Iraq and Afghanistan service grant, and that is specific to um, students or students whose parents may have served in those areas um, in military service. And then there's the federal direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans, as well as the federal direct plus loans. So keep in mind that um, pretty much everything from here up are considered grants and do not have to be repaid, whereas these last uh, three items are federal loan funds that do need to be repaid. And I do have one more, or well, two more, but this is another video real quick that I want to go ahead and information. Share. I just need to flip it over real quick. If you need If you need help paying for college or career school, the Office of Federal Student Aid might be your best option. We offer more than $150 billion to students each year in the form of grants, loans, and work-study funds. And federal student aid can be used to pay for school expenses, such as tuition, room and board, and books and supplies. After you've filled out the free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA, you'll receive an award letter from each school you list on your FAFSA. This letter explains both the federal and non-federal financial aid options that a school is offering you. So let's talk about federal aid. If you qualify for and receive a federal grant, you won't have to repay the money. That will definitely help offset the cost of school, but you may still need additional help. If so, a federal student loan might be your answer. Remember, a student loan is just like any other loan. It's borrowed money that will have to be repaid with interest. If you plan to take out a loan, Consider federal student loans first. Compared to private student loans, federal student loans often have lower fixed interest rates and offer many benefits that you won't find otherwise. For example, when it's time for you to repay your federal student loan, your loan servicer can work with you to find the best repayment plan for your individual needs. Plus, you may be able to adjust your loan payments based on your income. You also may be able to defer your federal loan payments, deduct student loan interest on your taxes, and even consolidate your eligible federal student loans into one loan with one monthly payment. Federal loans can even be forgiven based on certain types of employment. Getting a work-study job is another great option to help pay for school. Eligible undergraduate and graduate students will be able to earn at least minimum wage. If you have questions or need assistance, And so just wanting to elaborate a little bit more, my apologies, on um, just some Pell Grant basics. So as I mentioned earlier, the Pell Grant, in order to be considered, you do have to complete the FAFSA as well as for the other resources mentioned in the video. So whether it's the Pell Grant, student loans or work study, you do have to complete the FAFSA to be considered for all of them because this is the federal government's application to start the ball on all of those, specifically the grant, whereas the loan does have additional steps, um, which I do have one more video that will talk a little bit more detail about student loans, just so that um, you're aware that of all the steps that may be included with that. But um, just kind of as an, another FYI, families making less than 26,000 automatically receive what's known as a zero EFC, which means that their college bound student is eligible for the maximum amount of federal Pell Grant funding. For this current academic year, um, ending actually this August, the maximum Pell Grant is 6,495. And so if we think back to the very first slide where I was talking about the different um, colleges, you'll notice, right, even with the community college, and keep in mind those were averages, so right, that's right in the middle, that 12,000, um, and I'll say 12,500 roughly. Um, but if you're covering all costs of attendance associated with um, the average community college, a Pell Grant by itself may not be enough. And so I say this to remind us that even those of us that, you know, the poorest of us in our society doesn't necessarily get 
all the resources handed to them in order to receive um, the assistance they need, but that there is some other opportunities they may have to seek out, such as scholarships or work study. Um, even more personally, I can share that I even had to take out a student loan when I didn't realize that a certain scholarship was just a one-time opportunity and, not was, and was not going to renew or had no options to renew. And so the federal work study program, as I mentioned, is one, a grant that'll show up on your award letter. And it's essentially saying, this is how much you can earn for the academic year. It helps, allows you to pay for college expenses and you essentially earn this money through a paycheck. And so being a part of the federal work study program gives you the benefit of being able to get a job on campus, gain valuable experience. And there have been several studies that have shown that students who typically um, work while going to school typically have better time management and financial um, money management skills that um, others don't achieve until much later if they're waiting until after they graduate to start doing those things. Um, so you do, just like with any other job, you have to seek out employment. So that's you know looking for the school's college or um, career board, um, looking for their job board, um, maybe they have a resource known as Handshake where you can look for job opportunities on campus, but you still treat it like any other job. You would have to apply for that job. If you get calls, hopefully you get called an interview for it, um, be offered that job, accept that job and work you know, like a professional in that job because it is a real job and it gives you the opportunity to call back on those people for references. And again, just with a personal story, I'm still in relationship with the people that I worked with when I was at my community college as a work study student. So it definitely has value. And then I do have one last video, as I mentioned, that'll um, talk a little bit more um, just on responsible borrowing, if that is a reality that, or a potential reality for you. College or career school is an important step in achieving your future goals. And there are many financial aid options to consider. Did you know that a federal student loan can be a great way to help pay for school? After all, a grant, work-study job, or a scholarship can be a huge help, but these forms of aid may not cover the full cost of attending school. So if you decide to take out a federal student loan, it's important to understand what you are getting and be a responsible borrower. Getting a loan is a big decision. You might be paying your loans back for 10 years or more, so take your time to decide. And remember to accept only the loans that you need because you'll have to repay them once you're out of school. Here are a few things to keep in mind when deciding how much to borrow. Do some research. Make sure that your school is the right fit for you, both educationally and financially. Location, location, location. The amount of money you need to borrow can depend a lot on where your school is located. In-state schools and community colleges may cost less than out-of-state schools. And finally, getting an idea of your future income is also important when deciding how much to borrow. Starting salaries vary greatly depending on your career path, so it's worth thinking about how the amount of your loan will affect your future finances. After all, your student loan payments should be only a small percentage of your salary after you graduate. Once you've decided on your school and figured out how much money you should borrow, you'll need to sign a promissory note, which is an agreement to repay your loan. Make sure you keep a copy for your records. If you do take out loans, you'll need to keep in touch with your loan servicer when repayment begins. Your loan servicer will make this easy for you by offering web, email, and phone contact options. If you make this investment in your future, being an informed, responsible borrower can pay off in a big way. If you have questions... All right. Let's see. And so, as mentioned, you know, there are different types of student loans. And so I mentioned earlier, um, there's subsidized and unsubsidized as well as plus. Subsidized is the, I like to say, is when the government subs in for you. And so that means that they're paying the interest while you're in school, at least half time um, during any grace period or deferment period. So if you do have to borrow, these are usually the ones you want to borrow. Um, then there's the unsubsidized. Now in these ones, you know, just like 
you know, that beginning prefix un, meaning that they are not subbing in for you. And so the moment that pays towards your student account, you um, are getting paid or getting interest uh, put on those student loans during all periods. And then there's something known as a parent plus loan. And so if you're at a pretty expensive school, this is where you may see towards the end of your award letter, right after your subsidized and unsubsidized loans, the suggestion for your parent to borrow some plus loan on your behalf. But keep in mind that this is a loan that's under the parent's name and it cannot at any point be transferred to the student. However, there is kind of a small little hack that I'd love to share, which is that if parent borrowers, um, because this one is a credit base, these other two are not, um, parent borrowers, if, they're, if they have to seek a third party co-signer because they're not approved immediately, that actually allows then the student to borrow additional amounts of sub and unsub on their own. Um, so oftentimes as a, um, a joke, but yet all seriousness, I say, um, if the parent with the worser credit wants to apply, then that just kind of helps um, not necessarily to secure or sure up the fact that the student will get that eligibility, but you know, it just increases the likelihood that they would be able to get that eligibility. And then some factors to consider when taking out a loan. So some tips that I like to share is that, you know, monthly loan payments should not exceed 10% of your monthly take-home pay during your first year after graduation. And so I often suggest to students that they go to the Labor of Bureau, the Labor of Bureau, sorry, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, just flipping my words there, um, .gov, so that's bls.gov, to look at what career you're looking at going towards and seeing what those uh, income levels are. And it even goes as detailed as to the state that you plan on living in. And so this can give you a good estimate or average of what the income you could expect to get when you graduate into your particular career. And for easy math and examples, I'm going to give the example of 50 or if you made a salary of $60,000, right? No taxes in this example, just for easy math. But if you made $60,000 a year, that breaks down to about $5,000 a month. And so 10% of $5,000 is $500. And so in this example, you wanna make sure that your debt, um, your monthly loan payment doesn't exceed $500 a month. Another way of looking at this is making sure that your total loan debt does not exceed your projected first year annual salary. So using that 60,000 example, you wanna ensure that if you think 60,000 is what you're gonna borrow, do not, or not borrow, but earn, don't borrow more than $60,000 to ensure that you have you know, a manageable debt that you can handle after graduation. And with government loans, you do specifically get loan repayment options and forgiveness options, such as public service loan forgiveness. You might have been hearing about it a little bit in the media, but essentially if you go into um, certain lines of work with the government, local, um, state or federal, or certain civil service and nonprofit organizations, you have that opportunity to get public service loan forgiveness. Um, also, there is teacher loan forgiveness if you work in certain um, high need areas as well as there's income-driven loan repayment. So if for some reason you anticipated making 60,000 a year and you only come out and you graduate making only 45,000 a year, let's say, but you did borrow that 60K, then you're able to send your pay stub into the federal government and they will adjust your payment so that it's more affordable for you so that you actually can still live, eat, work and play. <laughs> And then I just want to talk a little bit about my office, which is the Student Scholarships, Grants, and Outreach. This academic year, we were able to appropriate over $150 million for seven different state financial aid programs. For undergraduate, all of which are for undergraduate students, most of which are need-based, but you can also find details about these programs, eligibility requirements, as well as fact sheets on our website at michigan.gov forward slash my student aid. And I will have a screenshot at the end with um, that same information. These are those um, seven and actually eight different uh, state programs. This last one, uh, Michigan Reconnect and Future for Frontliners would not be as relevant to you. Um, but the Children of Veterans Tuition Grant, 
is one of those for um, children of veterans. So if your parent is a disabled veteran or unfortunately passed in the line of duty, you may be eligible for this tuition grant. There's fostering future scholarship. So if you or anyone you know has experienced foster care in Michigan after the age of 13, you may be eligible for this scholarship. The Michigan Competitive Scholarship, that one requires a 1200 or higher SAT score um, and a need to be seen from your FAFSA when you complete that. The Michigan Tuition Grant is kind of the sister of the Michigan Competitive Grant um, Scholarship, but the difference is this one is for public institutions and this one's for private and independent. Then there's the Police Officer and Firefighter Survivor Tuition Grant. So similar to the Veterans one, if you had a parent or have a parent that um, became disabled or um, unfortunately passed away in the line of duty as a police officer or firefighter, you may be eligible for this uh, survivor tuition grant. There's the tuition incentive program, which is our largest program, which I'll actually be talking about in a couple slides. So to be eligible for all of our state financial aid programs, you do have to have Michigan residency and maintain that residency, be a U.S. citizen, permanent resident, or approved refugee, you probably are sick of me saying it at this point, but have completed a FAFSA because we wanna make sure you're getting all the resources you can to assist you to go to college. Usage at an approved Michigan college or university, so it does not go out of state with you. Enroll at least half time. And um, doubt you're in default on any kind of student loan since you haven't gone to college yet, but you do have to graduate with your high school diploma, certificate of completion, or its recognized equivalent, as well as make sure that you meet satisfactory academic progress institutional standards, which in short means maintain the GPA required for your program or institution. Um, don't drop out or fail any of your classes. And if you do, seek help. Hopefully before that happens. I mentioned earlier that March 1st is our deadline. Um, but for this year specifically, we've extended that to May 1st, and that deadline specifically is around the Michigan Competitive and the Michigan Tuition Grants. So you want to make sure that you always complete your FAFSA as soon as possible so that you don't lose opportunity for these specific grants. Because uh, you could have it one year, do your FAFSA late, and then not get it that following year. The way we know where to send your money is based on the order of the schools listed on your FAFSA. So the first Michigan school is the one we're gonna send your money to, but you can always go in and update your school order on your FAFSA and that'll update us. You can also create your student portal and update it there, as well as giving our customer care center a call and letting them know if your school of choice has changed. And again, I will have this contact information at the very end of the presentation as well. The tuition incentive program, which is our largest program, um, actually requires no application and students are eligible um, because they are identified from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Once they have been on or have had, have or have had Michigan Medicaid benefits for 24 out of a 36 month period between the age of nine and high school graduation. In order to ensure that you keep this tuition incentive program benefit, you wanna make sure that you complete high school before the age of 20 if you decide to do early or middle college, you wanna make sure that you graduate before the age of 21. And once you graduate, you wanna make sure to begin using your benefits, which means make us pay for some classes uh, within four years of high school completion. And once you've started school, then it, your benefits won't be forfeited until about 10 years after that first payment. Now the tuition incentive program works in two phases. Phase one covers uh, the cost of tuition at your in-district Michigan Community College. So if unfortunately you don't have an in-district community college, you may be responsible or you know, see yourself being billed for that difference um, because we only will pay the in-district rate at your participating community college that you decide to go to. And then we pay also up to $250 in mandatory fees per semester. If you decide to go to a Michigan independent or a private college that is eligible for our program, um, we will pay the average community college in district rate. So for this year, that is 118. So let's say um, if for some reason it costs 218 to attend your Michigan independent college, 
um, per credit hour, then that would be that hundred dollars would be the difference um, that you may be responsible for. And we still pay also up to 250 in mandatory fees. The cost of tuition at um, your Michigan Public University, we would pay the lower level resident rate. And again, up to that $250 in mandatory fees. Now phase one, I always call your associate degree or certificate phase. And essentially this phase, that's what we're looking at is making sure that you're working on your first associate or certificate program. Um, so your certificate program, if you decide to go towards one, must be a minimum of 24 semester credits and at least one academic year. And one academic year is a period of at least 30 weeks of instructional time. So usually that's 15 or 16 weeks of study per semester. Now, assuming you decide to get your associate's degree or enough credits to transfer to your four-year institution, that's where you would move into phase two during your junior year. And that's when we give you assistance that does not exceed um, $500 per semester. So in total, that's a maximum of $2,000 towards your four-year program in your last two years. And so once you've transitioned to being a junior, you've got within 30, you would want to complete phase two within 30 months. So essentially graduate with your bachelor's within 30 months. And MISSG, this is regarding our student portal I mentioned earlier. Um, essentially, you can create one of these accounts by, you do need your full social security number, as well as either a current year FAFSA on file or a TIP record on file. And so if you were interested in creating that portal, you could easily go to michigan.gov forward slash MISSG. And there's a lot you can do in that portal. You can apply for specific scholarships, receive important information from us regarding your awards and eligibility. You can update the college on file, update your contact information so that we're never missing where to send that. You can view your eligibility status, payment status, as well as email us directly. Of course, our website is a wealth of information. There you can see publications, detailed program information, um, additional resources regarding the FAFSA, connecting to us on social media, our scholarship self-service um, search tool is what I'll show you next, um, as well as some scholarship searching best practices to ensure that you're not just giving your information away. So this is our Michigan Scholarship Search self-service tool. You can go to our website, michigan.gov forward slash my student aid. And then when you click on that students and families tab, you will find a my scholarship search self-service tool link. And there you would choose the county that you're in and below would generate a list of scholarships that we're aware of based on the county you live in. And if you'd like, you can even generate a PDF so that you can get back to it, save it and get back to it later. And lastly, um, I just want to thank you all for allowing me to present to you today, My Student Aid, Making College Accessible, Affordable, and Attainable. And I ask that you connect with us on social media. At My Student Aid is our handle, and the benefit is that we're always going to remind you of when it's time to do various money-making opportunities, such as finding scholarships, doing the FAFSA. We are on Twitter. We are on Instagram and we are on Facebook. So allow us to be your friend and help you continue to find money on your college journey. So again, I'd like to say thank you. And I will pull that back up just so that if you'd like to, you can take a screenshot so you can give us a call, email us, as well as check out our website where all this information is also held. So oh, thank you so much, Felicia. Excellent presentation as always. Um, you guys in the chat, if you have any questions, you can yes. either raise your hand or you can type it in the chat box. If you raise your hand, I'll unmute you and you can freely speak. A lot of great information, Felicia. Is You guys. Are I know it's a lot, so. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is a lot, but but um, it's very valuable. All you, you know, you just have such wonderful programs available now for people to attend college and earn either certifications and degrees, whereas they they couldn't do it before. You know, um, 
I shared with you before, this past June, I finally paid off my student loan. <laughs> Happy <Congrats>. camper. <laughs> right? My gosh, congrats, right? I know, I know. And so for the opportunities to be available now as they are, where there's so many different programs for um, not just young people, but everyone to be able to get some type of certification or degree in a field um, or industry, that, that's just really awesome. I, I yes. commend you guys and the state and our governor for <laughs> implementing such programs, you know, it is just, it's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. I can, and I often, you know, tell students, like, there are people trying to move into the state to get these things, as well as, Absolutely. you know, with the Detroit Promise, you know, there's people trying to move into Detroit and certain areas in order to get these opportunities. So, you know, when you're, when you are where you are, and there's these opportunities, take advantage. Absolutely. Because um, I know a good handful of students will say to me, oh, I just really want to get out of Michigan. And I'm like, well, you can at least use the money and get the degree and then you can move out of Michigan and go work Absolutely. wherever. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> I, they, they, God love them. They have such, <laughs> you know, really grand ideas and I applaud, I really do applaud them. But I tell them, I'm like, but let me just share something with you <laughs> from experience. You know, you, you kind of might want to tweak this direction you're going in because you want to do it as debt free as possible because yes. again like i said i just paid off in a few months it'll be a year i i've been freed from the bondage of Hallelujah. Long. i know you know <laughs> <laughs> seriously oh my god I, I was getting ready to say we are laughing about it, but we know just how serious, you, you know, these payments, these monthly payments are, you know, and so I try to tell them, I'm like, look, you know, because, you know, it is so funny. You, again, God love them. Oh, I want to go into, you know, psychology and cosmetology. <laughs> And that's why I mentioned that uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics. You know, like, yes. dude, it's not like buying a sweater. You know, you can't pick multiple colors. But uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, of course. If there aren't any more questions, then we will bring this um, session to a close. And uh, thank you guys for joining. Um, thank you again, Felicia great Absolutely. presentation and, and i will go ahead I'll see you at the next <laughs> i was gonna say and i'll see you next month yep <laughs> perfect everybody have a great day take care everyone bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.